In a few videos so far, we made use of the normal distribution, assuming that you've seen it before and that you know more or less what its properties are. In this video, we'll take a step back and look at the normal distribution again, but from first principles. It's an important tool in what's coming up in this lecture and in the next, so we need to make ourselves eminently comfortable with the ins and outs. Here is the one-dimensional normal distribution. One of the reasons that the normal distribution is so popular is that it has a definite scale. If I look at something like an income distribution, the possible values cover many orders of magnitude, from zero to billions, and this is not the case with normally distributed phenomena. Take height, for instance. No matter how many people I check, I will never see a person that is five meters tall. The normal distribution is a way of saying, I'm not sure about the value of x, and I can't definitely rule any value out, but I'm almost certain it's near this particular value. There are a lot of phenomena for which this is the case, and that's why the normal distribution is used so often. This is the formula for the probability density function of the one-dimensional normal distribution. It looks very imposing, but if you know how to interpret it, it's actually not that complicated. In this video, we'll first see where it came from, and then we'll try to figure out what all the different parts mean. The normal distribution was invented, or perhaps discovered is a better word, by Carl Friedrich Gauss, undisputably one of the three greatest mathematicians in history. Gauss was working as an astronomer at the time and trying to estimate the positions and velocities of planets from noisy and fallible measurements. Now we've already seen that if we have a bunch of values, such as measurements, such as measurements of some quantity, and if they are normally distributed, then the maximum likelihood for the mean of that distribution works out as the arithmetic mean of our measurements. Of course, this is not the order in which things worked out historically. Taking a bunch of measurements and then taking their arithmetic mean has been done since at least the 3rd century BC, and the normal distribution only emerged at the end of the 18th century. For Gauss, the challenge was to make this derivation backwards. He knew that the mean was an effective method of estimation, and what he did was he took the principle of maximum likelihood as a given and asked himself what kind of distribution on the measurement error would give rise to the mean as an effective estimator. Let's see if we can reconstruct some of this thought process. We may not have Gauss's genius, but we do have the benefit of having taken this particular walk before in the other direction. We start by taking the arithmetic mean as a given. Together, with the principle of maximum likelihood. We'll not assume all the finer details of probability since Gauss didn't have access to them either. We'll just say that mu represents the truth which we are trying to measure. And there is some function f of a particular measurement value x in which mu is a constant that is larger for the measurements we are more likely to encounter. We assume that we get some measurement and that we choose the mu such that the product of these values over our series of measurements is maximal. The question now is what properties should f have for us to end up taking the mean if we do that? We start by taking the logarithm of f. This doesn't change the optimum and it turns our product into a sum. It's easier to work with and it already looks a little bit more like the computation of the mean. Now we know, and Gauss knew, that the derivative of our objective function is zero at the optimum. So the derivative of our objective function should be zero when mu is the mean of our observations. So the derivative of this log f, when summed over all the observations, should be zero at precisely that point when mu is equal to the arithmetic mean of the observations. To work out the derivative, we first need to get rid of the logarithm. And to do that, we'll make the further assumption that f is simply constructed by taking some other function g taking the negative of that function and exponentiating it. This will simplify things. The sum of the derivatives g for our observations x should equal zero when mu is equal to the mean. When f is large, g is small. So we can think of g as a metric of how unlikely and hopefully bad our measurement is. So with these conditions given, our job is now to take the equation describing the mean and rewrite it so that we can map it on to the equation on the left, and we can then read off what the derivative of g is. Here's the arithmetic mean. 
we multiply both sides by n, we move the sum to the other side, and we can view the term on the left as a sum over the value mu once for every instance in our data, so that we get two terms both consisting of the same sum, and we can take the sum sign out of the brackets, giving us this expression. And since it's equal to zero, we are free to introduce a constant multiplier too. This matches the expression of the derivative on the top left. So we can now see that the derivative of our function g that we're looking for, for the observation x, is two times x minus mu. And the function of which that is the derivative is the squared error. If we fill this into f, we see that the function f is the negative exponential of the squared error. And if we want this to be a proper probability function, we need a function that is proportional to this f. So if we strip away all the complexity, this is the only really important part of the normal distribution, a negative exponential for the squared distance to the mean. Everything else is adding features and making it behave like a proper probability distribution. So what does this curve look like? To simplify things, we'll set the mean to zero for now. Now remember that we described the normal distribution as having a definite scale. This means that we first need to make outliers incredibly unlikely. An exponentially decaying function like e to the power of minus x gives us that property already. Each step of size one we take to the right more than halves the probability density. After seven steps, it's one thousandth of where we started. After 14 steps, it's one millionth. And after 21 steps, it's one billionth of where we started. Taking the negative exponential of the square, as our function e to the power of x squared does, simply results in an even stronger decay, but it has two more additional benefits. First, the function flattens out at the peak, giving us a nice bell-shaped curve. This is in contrast to e to the power of minus x, which would give us an ugly discontinuity at the top if we were to make it symmetric. The second benefit is that this function has an inflection point, the point around 1.7 in this case, where the curve moves from decaying with increasing speed to decaying with decreasing speed. We can take this as a point of reference on the curve. To the left of this point, the curve looks fundamentally different than to the right of it. With the exponential decay, the function keeps looking the same as we move from left to right. Every seven steps we take, the density halves. With the negative exponential of the square, there is a place where the function keeps dropping ever more quickly, and a place where it starts dropping ever more slowly. And we can use this, as it were, to decide where we are on the graph, which will help us determine a characteristic range of values for our distribution. And since it's a symmetric function, we have another inflection point at minus 1.7. So we take these two inflection points as natural choices for the range bounding the characteristic scale of the distribution, the range of outcomes which we can reasonably expect. This is a little subjective, any outcome is possible and the characteristic scale depends on what we're willing to call unlikely, but given the subjectivity, the inflection points are as good a choice as anything. Incidentally, if you follow Gauss's logic for the median rather than the mean, you'll see that the corresponding distribution is one with the simple exponential decay, the so-called Laplace distribution, and this fits our intuition that when our data doesn't have a definite scale, like the income data, we should use the median rather than the mean. The inflection points are the peaks of the derivative. If we add a 0 0.5 multiplier to the inputs, the inflection points hit minus 1 and 1 exactly. This gives us a curve for which the characteristic scale is between minus 1 and 1 which seems like a useful starting point. And we can rescale this later to any range we require. Additionally, when we now derive the mean, the exponent two will cancel out against this one half, which means we don't even need to introduce the constant two multiplier. To change the scale, we add a parameter sigma. This will end up representing the standard deviation, but for now, we can just think of it as a way to make the bell wider or narrower. The square of the standard deviation is the variance, and either of these can be used as a parameter. We can work the square out of the brackets, like this, which is the more common form of writing this part of the distribution. We can now add the mean back in, with parameter mu. This shifts the center of the bell forward or backward, 
to coincide with the desired mean. Note that shifting a curve forward by mu points is the same as shifting the coordinates backward by three points. Likewise, we can think of the multiplication by sigma as keeping the curve the same, but simply drawing the ticks on the horizontal axis closer together or further apart. Finally, to make this a proper probability density function, we need to make sure that the area under the curve sums to 1. We can do this simply by integrating over the whole real number line, and if the result of that is z, we divide the function by z at every point. This gives us a function that then integrates to 1 over the whole of its domain. For our function, it turns out that integrating results in an area equal to the square of 2 times pi times the standard deviation. So there we have it. The probability density function for the one-dimensional or univariate normal distribution. And here we've indicated what the various parts of the distribution do. We can do the same thing in multiple dimensions. This gives us the multivariate normal distribution. We'll quickly run through how the different parts generalize to higher dimensions. We start by defining a curve that decays squared exponentially in all directions. Think of this as spinning our original function around the origin. The inflection points now become a kind of inflection circle. Inside this circle lie the most likely outcomes for our distribution. To give the circle, to give the inflection circle radius one, we rescale the exponent by one half as we did before. Note that the square of the norm is equal to the dot product of a vector with itself, so we write that instead. This time around, we'll normalize first and then introduce the parameters. Here it turns out that the volume under this surface is the square root of 2 pi to the power of the number of dimensions in our space. So we divide by that to ensure that the function integrates to 1. This function is the probability density function of the standard MVM, the one that has zero mean and variance 1 in every direction. To turn this into a parameterized family of multivariate normal distributions, we'll use a special trick. We'll start with this one and apply a linear transformation. We'll see that the parameters of the linear transformation then become the parameters of the resulting multivariate normal. Here's the formal way of doing that. Imagine that we sample a point x from the standard normal distribution. We then transform that point by a linear transformation defined by a matrix A and a vector t resulting in a vector y. What then is the density function that defines our probability on y? So if we transform a sample from x into y, we get a new distribution with a new mean, and our inflection circle becomes an inflection ellipse. Say we pick a point y in space, what can we say is the probability density for seeing that point after the transformation? Consider that the probability of ending up inside the inflection circle on the left must be the same as the probability of ending inside the ellipse on the right. And this is true for any contour line we draw. We get a circle on the left and an ellipse on the right, and the probabilities for both must be the same. This suggests that if we pick a point y on the right and we want to know its density, we can reverse the transformation to give us the equivalent point x on the left. And the density of that point under x, the standard normal distribution, must then be related to the density of y under q. So, in fact, it turns out that qy is proportional to the density of the reverse transformed point. The only thing we need to correct for is the fact that the matrix A shrinks or inflates the bell curve so that the volume below it doesn't integrate to 1 anymore. Now the amount by which a matrix inflates space is its determinant. So if we divide the resulting density by the determinant, we find a properly normalized density. This trick is a simple case of integration by substitution. And in general, when dealing with normal distributions, it can be very helpful to think of them as linear transformations of the standard normal distribution. So with that in hand, we can work out what the distribution qy is. We start with what we have, and we fill in the definition of p, which is 
the definition of the standard normal density that we already have. This gives us this expression for Q. Note that the x's in the expression on the right have now been replaced with the reverse transformed y. On the right, inside the exponential, we can simply use the basic properties of the transpose and the inverse to rewrite into this symmetric formulation. And on the left, we can rewrite the determinant to the square root, to the square root of the determinant of a times its transpose. We work this into the square root to the right of it, and inside the exponent, we can interchange the transpose and the inverse, so that both occurrences of the matrix A now read A times A transpose. This value, A times A transpose, we call the covariance matrix, and the translation vector T becomes the mean of our new distribution, mu. And with that, we have the final functional form of the multivariate normal distribution in terms of the mean and the covariance matrix, which, when we plot it as a surface over two dimensions, looks like this. This trick of seeing any normal distribution as a simple linear transformation of the standard normal distribution can also help us to work out how we should sample from a normal distribution. We can take the following approach. First, we'll take sampling from a univariate standard normal as red. This is usually done by an algorithm called the Box-Muller transform, if you're interested but we'll assume that somebody has implemented this for us. We can then transform a sample from the standard normal distribution into a sample from a distribution with given mean and variance, as shown here. We multiply by the standard deviation and add the mean. If we want to sample from a multivariate normal distribution, we first have to work out how to sample from the standard multivariate normal, and we can do that simply by taking d samples from the univariate standard normal distribution and concatenating them into a vector. We can then transform this to a sample from an MVN with an arbitrary mean or covariance matrix by finding an A such that A times its transpose equals our covariance matrix and transforming our standard normal sample by matrix multiplying by this A and adding on the mean. Now normal distributions are very useful and applied a lot but they are not always suitable. Here is the great distribution for this course from a few years ago. It doesn't look very normally distributed unless you squint a lot. The main reason it doesn't is because it has multiple peaks. These are called modes. And this often happens when your population consists of a small number of clusters, each with their own distribution. In this particular year, the student population was mainly made up of two different programs. And we can imagine that students from one program found the course more difficult than students from another program, and that the peak around 3.5 was that of students who only partially finished the course. This gives us three subpopulations, each with their own normal distribution. The problem is, we observe only the grades and we cannot tell which program a student is in. What we can do is describe this distribution with a mixture of three normal distributions. Here's how to define that kind of mixture model. We first define three separate normal distributions, each with their own parameters, and we'll call these the three components of the model. In addition, we also define three weights, which we require must sum to one. These indicate the relative contributions of the components to the total. In our example, these would be the sizes of the three subpopulations relative to the total. To sample from a distribution like this, we first pick one of the components according to the weights, and then we sample a point from that component. We'll mostly look at the model in one dimension, but it works the same for any dimensionality. Here's three components that might broadly correspond to what we saw in the grade histogram. We first scale each of them by their component weights. Now, since the areas under each of these curves were one before we multiplied by the weights, they are now 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4, respectively. And that means that if we sum these functions, the result is a combined function with an area of 1 under the curve, a new probability density. That looks like this. The black line is a new probability density function, which has more than one peak. For each x, we observe, each component could have been responsible for producing that x, but the different components have different probabilities of having been responsible for each x. That gives us a nice collection of distributions. 
The next step is given some data to fit the distributions to the data, to find the parameters for which the distribution covers the data most appropriately. And that's what we'll look at in the next videos.